Welcome to Thrive at Work, a podcast which offers insights and latest employment trends to help employers attract, retain and develop great people with me, Polly Rathbone Ward. With special guests, we're going to be discussing the many and varied aspects of HR, from practical topics to overarching cultural themes. We'll be looking beyond traditional styles of management to bring new and people-centred ideas to forward-thinking organisations that want to shape a new future where people can thrive at work. Hello, welcome to Thrive at Work. Today we are talking about neurodiversity and its implications for employers and within the current employment landscape. My guest today, I'm delighted to say, is Arabella Tresillian, and I'm so looking forward to this conversation about this very important topic of neurodiversity, which has so many implications for employers, from diversity, hiring, mental health, and much more. I'll let Arabella introduce herself in just a moment, but briefly, we actually go back quite a long way, as far as our school days, Um, And it's been a real delight to reconnect in recent years. So welcome, Arabella. Thank you so much for coming along to talk about this. Thank you so much, Polly. It's lovely to be here. Um, So just to start, Arabella, if you don't mind, would you be able to um, introduce yourself and your business and the sorts of services that you offer to clients? Sure. Thanks, Polly. Um, Well, I'm um, a mediator. I do workplace and employment mediation um, independently as Arabella Tresillian Mediation, but also with various other organizations. I specialize in mental health and neurodiversity um, and particularly mental health in the workplace. I'm, I'm also a mental health first aid instructor. And part of my dispute resolution work is also around um, supporting people with mental health difficulties in mediation. So um, that might be that it's uh, under the Mental Health Act, or maybe there are questions around capacity. So I do quite a broad, um, broad range of dispute resolution. And my real passion is ensuring that um, people are supported to find their voice to be able to resolve uh, dif- disputes and difficulties, and um, particularly within the workplace. Brilliant, thank you. As you can imagine, before um, we recorded this conversation, we were chatting, and there were quite a number of avenues that we actually could have gone down <laughs> for this conversation, um, because Arabella has such a broad range of experience um, in her background. Really fascinating, though, and there's quite an overlap and a link there with HR. So <clears throat> today we are discussing neurodiversity. So I wonder if we might start by you know, thinking about what we're actually talking about when we talk about neurodiversity, how would we define that, so to speak? Sure. Well, um, neurodiversity is a term with um, w- with many meanings. Um, it it's an umbrella term that speaks to various variations in the human brain that affect how we are in terms of things like our social um, interactions, our, our learning style our attention and our mood. And there are various uh, conditions that are typically understood to come under that umbrella. So um, some of them include, for example, autism, um, uh, dyspraxia, dyslexia, ADHD, Tourette syndrome. Um, But also we've got um, mental ill health itself can sit within that umbrella. Um, and equally acquired neurodiversity is something that is less understood but comes under that umbrella. So um, my kind of stepping into my interest here, I should say at this point, really comes from my own personal experience. So when I was in my um, mid-30s, Uh, I was diagnosed with autism and it made uh, just the most amazing difference to life because I had had all sorts of aspects to myself that seemed to be different to other people and this had really affected my mental well-being but it had hugely affected um, my 
my working life, my employment life, and actually having that diagnosis um, made a huge difference in terms of understanding myself. So I'm a real um, advocate for us being able to talk about neurodiversity. And I really just want to underline that it's something that we're all learning about um, collectively as we understand more about the brain. Um, and I'm, I'm just really excited that workplaces are kind of there's a gathering enthusiasm not only to understand what is meant by neurodiversity but also to support um, people who um, who bring different neurodiverse conditions but also most importantly a sense of oh my word the talent within um, some of what we might call neuro minorities or um, neurodistinct people. There's all sorts of different language. So yeah, it's a it's a broad uh, broad field. And um, what they do say is you you meet um, one neurodivergent person and you've met you know you know about one neurodivergent person. Everyone is different. So some of what I will talk about today is from my own personal experience. And some of it is around what I see in my uh, workplace mediation work, where many of my clients um, are particularly aut autistic or have mental ill health. Great. Gosh, thank you very much, Arabella. So you had this diagnosis in your mid 30s. So if, if we had understood more earlier, um, what sort of difference might that have made for you? Oh, golly, a huge difference. Um, I think, I mean, my career path was 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 complex. I had my children quite young, so my work was kind of sort of woven around um, being a parent. Um, so it wasn't maybe I didn't ever get a kind of typical trajectory. But what I can say is that my experience of employed life was just absolutely characterized by burnout and near burnout burnout and near burnout and um and also um really struggling to um to find my way within the workplace and within my role um and i now understand a lot more why that was the case <laughs> and i also have the opportunity to value that some of what i brought to my roles was exceptional mm. and I can now own that and understand why some of my creativity my um my kind of clarity of vision on certain things um my compassion towards others I now see as being very much part of that package I I I've always brought but definitely functioning as a um a neurodistinct person in a neurotyp neurotypical in workplace was exhausting, I think is the main, the main aspect, um, particularly as an undiagnosed person. Mm. Um, and I'll give you an example, which I'm hesitant to share, but I think it's helpful. Um, I worked in one place which um, my office was, um, had used to be a bathroom. It, was, it used to be a residential environment. And my office was a converted bathroom and everything had been converted apart from the lock. So I had a lock on the inside of my office door. And I remember a colleague coming in and saying, oh, my gosh, you've got a lock on the, the office door. And I said, well, I know it's so handy when you need a nap in the middle of the day. <laughs> and had the look on her face, a nap in the middle of the day. And I mean, this is some time ago. I was like, doesn't everyone need a nap? to get through the day and that was a real <laughs> the real telltale sign for me that that I was you know that there was difference now that's not to say that everyone needs a nap in the middle of the day but because I was trying to function in a neurotypical way I was exhausting myself I've now changed my working environment my work life to be what I call autism friendly and that's what you know, I and my work is about encouraging in, um, employers to simply understand a few things they can put in place to make their work environment and their 
policies and procedures more autism friendly if it's for autistic um, employees so that you can get the brilliant best out of those colleagues. Amazing. That's such an interesting example. That <laughs> well, I guess conforming to in such a way or having to act in such a way that you found it so exhausting that you actually needed to have a nap. That's amazing. Yeah. And yet, as you said before, um, you know, neurodivergent people in whatever way have so many other talents, don't they? Just because they may not fit within a, um, a neurotypical work working format mm -hmm. actually these different conditions if I can call it that do have so many other positives and I think we don't uh we don't utilize that do we we don't uh, we don't we we could create a situation where we are actually utilizing those skills more um so great thank you yeah, I guess if we could move on to what, you know, what are the benefits of encouraging neurodiversity in the workplace? Well, I think that, um, yeah, th that is really about having a sense of how much um, talent there is within the neurodiverse task force. So I, I like to think of neurodiversity or a, 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 as being about slightly different wiring you know, different neurological wiring. And actually, if you if you look at um, fMRI scans of um, different individuals, you'll see, you can literally see the kind of illumination around different parts of the brain. So what we do know if, and I'll speak maybe for autistic um, people, is that, um, or, you know, your autistic employees are likely to have several real strengths like um, problem solving skills, excellent memory, um, exceptional concentration and focus and real attention to detail. Um, we're characterized as being very honest and fair as well, even to a fault sometimes. Um, but also, sometimes we, you know, we will kind of, um, there's a great book called Thinking in Pictures by Temple Grandin. She talks about how she, she can sort of see the world in pictures and sort of see patterns and that makes us sometimes very good at strategic thinking um, and on the other hand while we're you know there's that creativity uh, for many of us there's a real kind of um, a high tolerance for relatively repetitive activities as well we can kind of come back to the same thing and we get really really good at it so um, there's a lot that we can bring and um, what we need is simply um, a supportive environment to be able to bring uh, bring some of those talents and and I really want to underline it with a, a another example I um, for a while was a, a teacher um, I was a, I taught English English literature and language and um, the founders of the school it was an international school had um, the, the teacher had um, dyslexia and her three children had dyslexia. So there was a, the whole school was really kind of formatted around supporting people with dyslexia. And I became quite good at identifying undiagnosed dyslexia. And this is how it went. If I gave students and I was teaching secondary students the opportunity to do creative writing and not to have to think about spelling or punctuation, but let it flow. I would get from our dyslexic students or our undis undiagnosed dyslexic students, these, these pieces of creative writing of such exceptional creativity and imagination that it would you know, just sort of make your socks pop off and all sorts of interpretation of spelling and punctuation and so on. And those young people had typically been held up and hauled over the coals for, you know, you've got to go back to basics and get your spelling right or your punctuation but once you could pick up this absolute mine of imagination and creativity in the dyslexic students then you know suddenly we were on to something and um so and it would be very exciting there were a few people i'd be able to say to the students you know i i, I think i i think i've noticed there's real creativity in your work and i'm you know i'm i'm wondering if you know taking care not to diagnose but we might explore a, a dyslexia um 
diagnosis until within the school it became you know really uh not quite a badge of honor but an understanding that if you had a diagnosis of dyslexia the likelihood is that you were creative that you were um, compassionate, that you had lots of great visual thinking. So these are the talents that we've got available to us in the workplace. If we can let go of some of those, you know, old thinkings, like, you know, the equivalent of in the school, well, what is your writing worth unless it's spelled correctly? That is, that's for an old, you know, an old way of thinking. So yeah, I'm I'm really excited as we as we find um, big employers starting to seek neurodivergent employees to be able to enjoy the benefits of their skills. I love that you're you're creating such a positive angle about it as well. I think that's such a lovely thing to say, <laughs> make someone feel really great about it, um, rather than something that could be quite daunting and quite scary and quite negative, and you don't really understand it. Um, you know you're making it sound incredibly positive um, and celebrating those strengths and those differences well I think it is a it is a positive thing and in fact at the end of my long diagnosis process it was you know lots of filling in you know kind of forms and interviews and so on and so forth at the end of it um, the psychologist diagnosing me said I've got some really exciting news for you congratulations I'm pleased to let you know that you are autistic. And it was a moment of real affirmation and real kind of celebration that set me on the right path, I think, for, um, for feeling like I could dive into my own wiring. Um, and we certainly know that for um, women and girls, it can be, you know, historically, it's been really difficult for us to be uh, diagnosed. And um, because we're very, as you know, often we're, we're very strong in terms of what's called masking, um, mm. which is the exhausting bit. Mm. So, um, so, yeah, it was the end of a long journey, but also the beginning of um, that diagnosis was the beginning of a, um, a wonderful exploration of, around what happens if I actually work according to my own brain and can enjoy uh, the benefits of that, but also understand better how to support what is going to make my system, you know, work to its it, it, its its best advantage. Mm, absolutely, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so, just to give an idea of the scale of this, um, do we know how many people, um, you know, actually have uh, neuro are neurodivergent in some way? Do we have any information about that? Yeah, well, we, we know that it's um, at least uh, one in a hundred. Um, so that 1% of any large workforce is likely to be neurodivergent. But the current estimation is actually that it's one in five of the general population, which takes us to 20%. Um, so it's, um, it, it's, much more prevalent than is generally understood. Um, and we do know that some 80% of any disabilities are hidden. Um, and this brings us to the question of, you know, are we talking about disabilities here? And how does this sit um, within the Equality Act 2010, which of course is really an important part of an employer's um, kind of duty of care so yeah we can go on to talk about that if you you know when when you'd like but in other words it's 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 much more prevalent than people typically assume yeah wow yes great okay so um and is there any link between mental health and neurodiversity that we know about yeah um i mean there's sort of really good ongoing research um, around this and um, and I would you know direct people to to the most recent research but what I can say on a on a top line is a couple of things really we do know that um, that anxiety tends to be um, a kind of a, a very strong factor in uh, in neurodivergent people and um, particularly if I you know I can speak a little bit around um, autistic individuals so 
this anxiety can be linked to things like um, sensory triggers or simply um, having concerns about getting things wrong. We have very high degree of perfectionism. Um, we have apprehension about being sort of put on the spot in a social situation. Um, we work really well with routines and familiarity. So disruption of routines can result in, in anxiety. Um, and also we, many of us will have, um, kind of this effect of a kind of cocktail of emotions that we have difficulty naming. Um, so it might be that we we're feeling sadness or grief, but we couldn't name it and it becomes something very physical and very embodied in us. Um, so that's another example of why, you know, why anxiety can be a thing. And, and if we, you know, if we look at the brain, the, um, the sort of the parts that deal with a sense of threat, um, in our brain can be more sensitive and sensitized in autistic people. We can sometimes have a quite, what I think of, I like to think of my amygdala as being quite sensitive. So it, I, it's, I'll be quicker to go into fight or flight than the next person. Mm -hmm. So that's anxiety. The other aspect is, would be perhaps depression and low mood. And this is, it can be to do with emotional dysregulation, it can be to do with um, neurological and neurochemical imbalances, but it's also often simply that um, as neurodivergent people, we are, um, we are misunderstood. Our mannerisms are often interpreted as us being um, <laughs> less intelligent or, or younger than our years or um, childish. Um, and again, this is just misunderstanding of just just difference. And there's some prejudice that, that, you know, that can be at play there. So that combined with things like, a, a, you know, a tendency to burnout can make it harder in life for us to have some of those successes that are more available to neurotypical people. So it can be harder for us to have success getting a job because we maybe don't present as um, professionally as the next person but actually we might have really excellent credentials and be really potentially really brilliant at the job but in an interview maybe we don't that doesn't come across so well and similarly in relationships we can get knockbacks we're including in the workplace so many of the um, conflict resolution pieces I do are around broken relationships um, um, which is really devastating. So it's kind of unsurprising that that might then result in low mood or depression as an individual struggles to meet some of their personal goals that seem much easier to attain for, um, for you know, neurotypical friends and, and colleagues. Great, thank you, absolutely. Um, so what have you seen um, in, in terms of your clients um, in this area in terms of what they're doing to support neurodivergent employees or even welcome them. I mean, we've talked about hiring and potential, um, you know, recruitment, finding it very difficult to present or, or not presenting yourself um, in a way that's um, perhaps expected. Um, so what, what can employers do and what are you seeing in terms of your clients um, in this area? So, yeah, it's such a great question. Um, so the, the biggest factor I see, I would say, um, and, and this is particularly around autistic employees, and, uh, and I speak to that because that's an area that I have more insight on. So it's not to say that there aren't others, but where I am seeing patterns is um, often uh, there can be a difficulty between an employee and a manager in terms of expectations, productivity, and performance. Now, in short, what I am seeing is that often a manager with a, um, a team member who is an autistic may, may not take the time to explain what is expected, may 
make a lot of things implicit because they're worried about kind of being bossy or rude to that, you know, or kind of micromanaging. But then when the autistic employee doesn't kind of fill in, you know, doesn't pick up with psychic powers on what was actually intended, then that employee is held up um, for, uh, you know, performance problems or productivity problems. That is for many autistic employees, their worst nightmare. They start to become afraid, concerned, um, and in that instant, you know, often less able to communicate well. So then the relationship starts to break down. So often I'm coming in to help um, repair that relationship. And really often it is just about making the, um, the implicit explicit and building in routines that keep check-ins in play so for example and this is across all of my workplace mediation a classic factor is that one-to-ones have vanished <laughs> manager direct report one-to-ones have vanished because we're all busy or because it became uncomfortable so those routines of checking in and clarifying communication are really valuable and also to take time not to put someone on a kind of performance improvement plan too quickly but actually explore what's going on underneath it might be that the person has not been performing brilliantly because they're in the middle of an open plan office and they you know and the flashing lights and the noise is impacting them so you can ask them to you know up their game as much as you want as a manager but it may be that actually resituating that employee would solve the problems. So that uh, that brings me to another factor, which is around obviously the challenges of COVID. So for many autistic employees, there was some benefit in actually working from home. Those that were able to work from home, you're taking away the stress of busy commutes. There's the routine at play. That we're in our own sensory environment. We don't have to wear uncomfortable clothes. We can wear comfortable clothes and we're not being disturbed. So, um, however, for some, it's meant that communication has dropped to the point that it's become problematic between, for example, team members. So, again, needing to us needing to make sure that there are routines and rhythms of, of communication. But also, I think as we start to think about coming back into the office, that obviously is something that's really kind of um, challenging. So, you know, I, th I would advise to uh, employers to really think, you know, and I know you've spoken, um, Polly, and given such good advice to people on, you know, how to make the transition back into the office as, as safe and secure for everyone as possible and to keep talking about it. So, um, yeah, communication, <laughs> environment, and I think, yeah, just, just lastly to touch on those sort of inclusive recruitment practices, you know, think about what is actually an essential part of your job description. Are there ways in which that potential employee can prove their skills in other ways? And also, can you give a window onto your working life? Um, you know, potential working life as part of that recruitment process so the employee can get a sense of what it might feel like. Um, these are uh, many of these brilliant ideas, by the way, I have to give credit to um, this amazing organization called Waymakers, who I do some work with. Um, so Alex Kelly um, has taught me a lot about, you know, what makes for, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of neurodiversity friendly workplaces so again she's got some really good resources there um, we can maybe share the link brilliant yes we absolutely will that's great thank you for um, mentioning that as well that's really interesting to hear fantastic thank you um yeah so we talked about um you know the benefits of diversity um you know broadly and the, the legal aspects we just started to touch on um, was there anything else that you wanted to sort of mention about that, Arabella? Uh, yeah, so the, the legal aspects, I think it, I think it is worth um, touching on. Um, obviously, the, um, the um, Equality Act 2010 makes clear provision that people with disabilities um, um, 
might need access to reasonable adjustments. So, um, as you know, your colleagues will will, will know if if someone's condition is you know has lasted or is likely to last last twelve months or more, um, and has a significant impact on their ability to carry out their activities of day-to-day -day life, including work, then they may well be covered by the um, Equality Act and protected from discrimination. So in terms of exploring um, what reasonable adjustments might be suitable for an employee, then obviously you've got um, uh, resources like occupational health, um, you've got wellbeing action plans, which can be really helpful for kind of brokering that conversation between a manager and an employee. Um, Mind has some great uh, wellness action plans that I really recommend. Um, but also there are, um, you, you, there are various Sort of charities and organizations that like Waymakers, like the National Autistic Society, um, like mentalhealthatwork.org.uk, that will have all sorts of suggestions for reasonable adjustments. And I really think it's about being creative in terms of thinking about what's possible. You know, this pandemic has allowed us to see that. There's so much in, that is possible in terms of flexibility that we never thought was the case. People working from home, that won't work. Well, my goodness, it has worked. So the flexibility, but always letting the, um, the employee kind of be able to have space to you know, have conversations that allow them to share in a, in a safe confidential way how it is that their day looks and their weeks look and what might you know how they are because they're going to be unique I you know I do do some I do employment mediation cases um, uh, where there have been employment tribunals um, you know maybe the preliminary hearing or, or maybe it's moved through a tribunal you know uh, disability discrimination cases are really really tough for everyone involved um, and they can take a long time. Mediation plays a really helpful role there. And in fact, I've just done a few cases where, um, you know, the judge has said, please you know, go back and see if you can sort, sort this out in terms of mediation um, around working conditions, but also around um, exit uh, agreements, exit settlements. So for me, that's really valuable because the court rooms are really challenging for us as neurodivergent people. So where whatever there can be to support conversations where you get that, you know, the kind of the win-win understanding of what works for the employer, what works for the employee. And always, of course, our managers are our kind of, you know, our silver bullet. So that real support and training for managers, we often expect managers to understand how to kind of work with all kinds of different people, but often um, they haven't had access to the training. And that can just mean that they don't feel confident to ask questions around what would help you. So um, I would also recommend that, um, that employers, you know, take the time to get some training for themselves but particularly for managers just to kind of do some myth busting and feel more confident around um, around appreciating neurodiversity and being able to be practical and pragmatic to support employees great thank you I think that was a really good uh, tip actually so if there were some employers out there thinking right I would really like to do something about this I can see the necessity and how important this is um about, I wonder if you could um this is putting you on the spot a little bit but <laughs> two or three sort of top tips Arabella just to sort of where to start you know because it can be quite daunting I think for an employer to think oh my goodness what well, you know I knew I know I need to do something about this but I'm not quite sure how or what I need to do do you have mm -hmm. any sort of top tips <laughs> yes my first top tip would be to discover um you know, who you've got within your organization who would like to share their insights and their voice into the organization becoming 
um, more aware of neurodiversity. That alone will allow people who are neurodivergent or who have an interest or who have a sibling or, a, you know, some lived experience to be able to come forward and start to, um, you know, be, be um, stir us up of, of new thought and, and new ideas within the organization. So always start with lived experience where you can without asking people to disclose or anything like that, but invite the expertise that you already have on the ground. Then I would say, start to just do some investigation. I've mentioned Waymakers, their website's really good and they talk, um, Alex Kelly writes about the autistic lens in a way that I think is um, more uh, insightful than the many people that I've, I've come across. So just start to do, you know, to do some reading and so that you yourself can start to get the sense of, oh my gosh, this is, the brain is amazing and we are all amazing. And there's so much to discover here. And you can, you know, as an employer or a manager or a CEO or, um, you know, head of HR, start to get excited about this topic rather than in any way feeling overwhelmed or like it's just something else that you've got to do and then thirdly I would say bring in someone who can do some training um, maybe someone with their own lived experience um, who can get the conversation going so that you can start to be a kind of you start to discover your champions within your organization I think there is value in you know exploring whether employees want to kind of focus on mental health and neurodiversity collectively or whether that's something that you're big enough you'd want to look at it separately but I think they go really well together it this is about you know psychological well-being and valuing the the difference and the diversity within our organization so it sits nicely within you know equality and diversity but also under talent management um, and it also sits under you know kind of like the financial bottom line of let's have some great people really um, thriving um, within our organization so those would be some starting points and maybe you have your own Polly so do do add <laughs> I think that's amazing advice. That's fantastic advice, I think. Um, and I think it is all about culture, isn't it? The culture of the organization and doing, you know, starting with some of those tips, I think is a brilliant way to sort of open up um, the culture a little bit to, to just start, start having some of those conversations and being more aware of it and also being open to the understanding of it. And, um, you know, and I love the way you speak so positively about it. All. <laughs> it's really encouraging. Brilliant. We are coming up to the end of um, our time. I can't believe it. It's blown by. <laughs> um, just lastly, Arabella, if you wouldn't mind, um, if people would like to get in touch with you or carry on the conversation with you, how can people get in touch with you? Oh, that, that's so kind. Um, so I'm at ArabellaTrasillian.com and on social media, I'm... Um, School of Dialogue. So School of Dialogue is my kind of um, my little brand where I share tips and some courses as well on conflict resolution and conversations that kind of um, for, for mental well-being. And um, so, yeah, those are the two places. And um, yeah, thrilled to, to answer people's questions in, in any way. Uh, this is these are topics I love. So yeah very open to that <laughs> that's wonderful thank you so much Arabella and uh, we're going to leave it there but um, thank you so much for your time today thanks Polly thanks for having me it's been really nice